we have time for at the end of the presentation. If the question is somewhat complex and we need more time to answer, we do promise to follow up with you for those. So let's take a look at today's agenda. I will begin by doing introductions to Dunn Solutions Group. From there, I will hand over the presentation to today's presenter, Brandon Novi, and Brandon will go into the BI platform, the web intelligence tool, and an information design tool. So let's begin. Dunn Solutions has a long history of delivering innovative business technology solutions to companies. We are headquartered just outside of Chicago and have offices in Minneapolis, Raleigh, and Bangalore, India. Our offerings fall into two practice areas. Our application development solutions feature portals, e-commerce, and content-managed websites, mobile and custom application development, as well as search, optim search engine optimization solutions. Our analytics solutions feature predictive analytics and BI platforms, as well as data warehouses and data integration. We are authorized SAP and LIFRAE training providers and offer classroom, virtual, private, and custom options. We believe training is important because once we deliver a solution, we want to make sure that those who need it know how to use it and maintain it. Our clients, some of which are included here, are a combination of Fortune 500, mid-market companies, government agencies, and nonprofits across all verticals. About 80% of our business are commercial clients, and 20% are nonprofit and government. We maintain strong partnerships with top technology companies in order to offer your client, our clients the most innovative solutions available today. Our application development practice develops solutions that are custom and help differentiate our customers from their competitors. We provide solutions on portals, e-commerce, and content-managed websites, custom transactional applications, as well as mobile applications for integration with back-end systems. We've been doing custom application development since our inception in 1988, and it's one of our core practice areas. Our analytics practice helps deliver information to decision makers throughout your organization so that it runs better. We can help with the decision making by not only looking into the rear view mirror, but also looking forward into the future by leveraging predictive analytics and data mining techniques. Our analytics ex experts also offer cloud services that include migrations, data warehousing, and big data services in order to offer a complete portfolio of solutions for our clients. We are an SAP Gold Partner and have been a top-level partner for nearly 20 years. As an SAP authorized training partner, we help companies nationwide maximize their technology investments and offer public, private, virtual, and custom courses. Our public cl classrooms are located in Minneapolis and Raleigh. Please contact us for any SAP training needs your company may have. We offer a global delivery model that gives us the flexibility to build teams that are best suited to our clients' timelines, budgets, and preferences. Projects that utilize offshore resources are always led by someone local and U.S.-based. Thank you for allowing me to introduce you to Dunn Solutions. I will now hand over the presentation to Brandon Novi, our analytics project lead here at Dunn Solutions. Welcome, Brandon. Thank you very much, Megan. As Megan said, my name is Brandon Novi. I'm an accredited SAP consultant and trainer. I've been working with some of these business optics tools for over a decade now. And I'm also, I also teach several classes. I teach web intelligence, Crystal, dashboards, Lumira Design Studio, the traditional universe design tool, and the current information design tool, as well as I do several uh, installations, either brand new business objects installations or upgrades. I've upgraded like a XI to version 4.1, 4.2. So I thought I'd jump right in and talk about the platform part that is new in version 4.2 of Business Objects. One of the new features, they have a recycle bin. So it'll save you a lot of time as an administrator being able to retrieve files. There's also now a BI administrator's cockpit, which doesn't replace monitoring. It's kind of a, a new feature. So it's kind of the, the dashboard to, compared to monitoring so on a deep dive look at your system. There's also a split installation, which allows for less downtime if we're doing an upgrade, as well as some new changes to the upgrade manager that I really love. So the recycle bin is only available in the central management council. 
it is available for administrators. So it used to be before the recycle bin, if somebody deleted a report, they they have to call the help desk, may log a ticket, and ah, uh, you have to go administrate up to then go grab last night's backup, maybe spend an hour or so getting the file back. Now the file can be restored in just a matter of seconds. One thing to note though, depending on how your company develops reports, is that the recycle bin only works with public folders. So if you do a lot of development, serious development in your my favorites, just warning that the recycle bin does not work with my favorites. It's just something to keep in mind. Maybe that'd be a good idea to look into maybe doing more development in your public folders instead. Another thing to keep in mind is that the recycle bin is not on by default. So before you start using it, you have to remember to go and enable it. And let me show you how that looks in the Central Management Council. So the first thing I'd want to do in the CMC is go to my applications and then go to the recycle bin application and just make sure it's enabled. Now, I already have enabled this for my demo, but one of the things I just want to show you is that you can change the number of days in which it'll do an automatic removal of files. And once you have that set, you can go to your recycle bin. And I see right here I have some files that have been deleted. So here's one, shared element three. Before I restore it, I just want to show you that if I click on properties, I can see where it was deleted from and the time it was deleted. So if I had multiple versions, I could pick the correct one. And I also know that this will go into my DSG demos folder. So if I look at my launch pad, so I'm going to the launch pad, the, what the end users see. I can see here, I don't have any, the shared element three is, not, is missing. I can go back to my central management council and I can restore the file. And then if I go back to my launch pad, just press my refresh button, and I can see the file has been successfully restored. Much, much easier than having to go to your backup. So some benefits again of the recycle bin, you can restore your items within seconds. And another thing, all the items are located on one screen, so you're not poking around trying to find things through a backup. And it's just a lifesaver, life a time saver for administrators. Next thing, we have the BI Administrator's Cockpit, and I really love this. From the Central Management Council, you can go in and you can just get a quick glance of what's going on with your environment. Again, it's not replacing anything, it's just a, a new feature. As, as I said, think of it as an interactive dashboard to like monitoring, which would kind of be like a, a report. So I can quickly go in here and see all my servers. I can see that all 30 are running. And click in here, just to get some quick information on all my servers. If any were failed, rather than having to dig down and see which are failed, I could just click right on this button. And I can even click on any of these, just to get some more information about them, like when they were last changed. Again, I still have my original server list, so that's still here where you'd go in and make your changes. So it's just a new tool. Let me go back to the cockpit. Some of the things I'd like to show you. We also have a way to look at your scheduled jobs. So you don't have to always go to the instance manager. You can just go in here. I can see I've had some jobs that ran successfully. And I can see if any have failed today. And I can even look at statistics. So I can see which jobs have the most instances. So this one right here, this report, has been run it has more than three instances. I can even see the jobs of the longest runtime. This is my parallel query demo. Now this is just today. I can go up to the corner and I can change it maybe for the last 30 days and I can see what's been running. Now my numbers are, are very small because this is a, my demo server. I don't have uh, hundreds of people using the server. I can go down below and I have content usage so I can see which items are active or which are inactive. I can even go to maybe last 30 days. If I click on active, it automatically goes to the inactive and I can see which items aren't really used much 
or I can go to active content and see which items are used very often. So for example, the sales by state has been um, looked at, opened up 36 times, and when it was last run. I can also go to my statistics, and I can see some things like which inboxes have unread content. So I can see the one with my name. I've got something that has been run. But again, if I had more people, I'd have more items here. I also can see which universes have the most content. Now, I just want to just bring this to your attention. This is not the number of objects. So I, if anyone here has worked, took a, taken an SAP training class, you may be familiar with eFashion. I do not have 5,273 items in my universe. This is actually the ID. This is a really helpful. If you happen to have multiple copies of a universe, which I happen to have multiple eFashions, I can see that the ID for eFashion that's 5273 is run about the same time as 5274, but at least if there's difference, I can see which one was which. And I can also go to my applications, one last little piece. I can see which items, new artifacts are from today of three webbies. Or I can look at the last 30 days. And I've had, in the last 30 days, I've had 19 webbies, two design studios, and one Lumira. So again, the cockpit doesn't replace anything. It's just another tool to quickly look at how your server is operating. Just a quick overview of your servers, your scheduled jobs, uh, your content usage, and any application usage, any new objects, items that have been created. Next, we have the split installation. And this is pretty slick in that this will lower the amount of downtime. Now, by default, if you just double-click the setup.exe button, if, you're, if you've ever done installations, the double-clicking will do the same as before. But if you use the command prompt and you type in this command, setup.exe-cache, and then you, just give it a, you give it a path and a file name to create a response file, it'll start the installation, and then about halfway through it, it'll just pause and say caching's completed successfully. So the idea is that you can leave, if you're doing an upgrade, you can leave your business object server up and running while you do this first caching step. And that may maybe take 15 minutes, an hour, depending on how big your, the speed of your servers. But then, once the caching's finished, then you can go and uh, work with your company to you know, schedule time to take down your server. And then you can finish it up after you've taken everything down and run a command that says dash resume after cache. Just note that you'll have to feed it the response file you created. And the response file, by default, will enter a bunch of stars, asterisks, for any passwords. So like your cluster key or password, you have to type that in. But some benefits, besides, as I mentioned, less downtime for your upgrades, is that the response file can be used if you, especially for a multi-server environment. Let's say you have you know, two or three servers that have like the same passwords. There's just less manual entry. You just feed them all that file, so you don't have to go and type in the product key or your passwords again and again. It'll just read it from that file. The last thing I wanted to mention regarding some platform changes are changes to the Upgrade Manager. Upgrade Manager has always been able to do logging, but I recall one time I did an upgrade, and everything worked, but two files failed. And I had to you know, dig through the logs. I had to dig go to Google to figure out where, what the logs were, where now with the upgrade manager, the, it will tell you exactly where your log path is. So once the, everything finishes, you can know exactly where to go to get your information. You can also set your log level as well if you want a lot of detail or, or less detail. Some new filters I really love are the ability to filter by uh, start modified start and end dates, as well as object type, and you can also filter by objects if they've been migrated already. So let's say you, you run a, you do an upgrade and uh, you, didn't, you don't quite finish, but then some people go in and make some changes maybe on a Saturday. You can come back Monday, see what reports have changed, and then just migrate those reports that have the modification date from between when you first started the upgrade and when you finished. And also another nice thing is being able to hide objects that were already migrated, because while it doesn't really affect anything to remigrate them. It can just take a lot of time. So you can say, don't remigrate things that are already good as they are. 
So again, just some benefits of the upgrade manager. You can change the log level from the, within the GUI. You can also look at the log path within the GUI. You don't have to go look through the admin guide to figure out where the logs have been going. And you can filter now by modification date, type, or migrated objects. Next part I want to talk about is web intelligence. Web intelligence has been given a lot of love in version 4.2. I know I was, I was kind of nervous when, uh, when it couldn't connect directly to HANA, but SAP has finally given it direct connections to HANA, so I'm very happy to see that. And another thing I really love are parallel queries. So you don't have to wait for query one, and query two, and query three, et cetera. It'll all run at once, depending on your connection. We also now have support for big numbers, and we have support for GeoMaps right in the desktop interface. Some of you may be familiar with the little tricks and you could do to get maps to work either on a tablet or you'd have to buy a third-party solution. Now you can use GeoMaps right inside of, of Webby. There's also now a commenting system, so you can leave a note and your colleagues can come in and look at your note and respond right to your note. And also, you can share parts of Webby. So let's say you build a really great chart you're very happy of, you spend an hour, Rather than having to copy-paste that or recreate it again and again in other documents, you can just sh share to save out that chart into the launch pad and bring it in multiple times. So with HANA connections, as I said, you no longer have to go and build a universe. You can go straight to HANA. And another thing is SAP has finally added another connection type to the DHTML. So, Originally, if you weren't allowed to use Java for whatever reason, you're kind of stuck using universes. But now you can also use universes as well as HANA. And rumor has it there's a support pack three coming up by the end of the month. Rumor has it they're going to have a couple other connections as well. I believe a Excel, but I'll double check that. So you may have noticed that there are two HANA connections. So what's the difference? There's one that just says SAP HANA. That allows you to go directly to a HANA analytic or calculation view. And you can also, then you'd use the query panel like you would with traditionally with the universe or Excel to add objects to your Webby data provider. The HANA online version works a little differently in that there's no query panel. Let's say you go to your view, it brings in a bunch of objects. So let's say you have, uh, on your side panel, you have a list of 30 objects. If you bring in eight of those, it'll go hit Go back to HANA, run query to bring back your eight objects to display in your table. If you bring in object 9, 10, and 11, it'll bring in, it'll rerun the query on the fly back to HANA and bring in the rest of the objects. So it's, it's constantly going back to HANA. So again, some benefits of these connections to HANA. You, don't, you can go to HANA without a universe. You can also just access the views with or without the Webby query panel, depending on your needs. Parallel queries, this is a big, big time saver. Before 4.2, all of the queries would run in, in series. So if you had three queries, that, and it took three and 11 seconds, it would, run, it would take up to 23 seconds to run. Now in parallel, the length is just the length of the longest query. So it'll run, the end user will only experience 11 seconds of wait time. One thing to note, though, with parallel queries, these are the only supported data providers. So both the old UNV and current UNX universes, SAP HANA is supported, Freehand SQL, and text files, which are supported in the Web Intelligence Rich Client. Just a little technical note for those of you who need to change this. Parallel queries are enabled by default, but an administrator can disable or change the maximum concurrent jobs if necessary. They would have to go into the actual server itself and modify this XML file in both the 32-bit and 64-bit connections. If someone's using rich client and they also want to change it, they'd have to go and modify this file. And then the file's pretty big, so you just have to go and find this Webby param max concurrent refresh jobs and change that. Now, let me just show you a quick little demonstration for those of you who want to kind of try this at home. 
I have a little parallel query demo I built, and my screenshots I took right from this. So you can see here, this one took, I have my three queries. And if I just run it, I can see it did take 14 seconds. So that's the length of the longest query. Now this time is, hey, a little faster, it only took 11. But for those technical people that are just curious, there's a little command you can run if you want to try this at home. Call the last execution duration. And if you put in the query, it'll give you the time of query one or two or three. Or if you just put in the command without a query, it'll actually just give you the, the, the time it actually took for the, from the end user's point of view. This little number 24 is just a concatenation of three, three of my queries. So again, the benefits of the parallel queries, less runtime for the end user, and it is supported in several of the data providers. Big numbers are also supported. So the precision of decimals, if you switch from just number to decimal, goes to 40 digits, and it's available right in the object panel. Now, if you're using uh, a universe measure, you can just right-click and you can change your type from number to decimal. Or if you're working with uh, a variable, you can play with it. You have to go in and use the two decimal function. I can show you how this works really quickly. So again, all you have to do is just find your number, change the type, and you can switch from number to decimal. Or in my sales tax, again, I just have a little command. I was just playing here. I can just go. And now it's a decimal type. So again, the benefits of big numbers is that the, it has increased the precision to 40 digits, which is the IEEE decimal floating point. You can change a measure from number to decimal in the report interface if you're working with, again, with a universe measure. Or if you're working with a variable, you can change from number to decimal in the formula editor using the two decimal function. So now we're getting into what I think are the, the really fun features. Uh, commentary, where this is where you can go and add comments and share with your colleagues. So with comments, end user, and uh, it's all security based, so uh, you can turn this on or off as your users need it to, and users can add, edit, or delete comments just right in the webby document, and then the most recent comment would be displayed right in the document, and then a list of all the comments, a history of it, is kept in the side panel on the left. A little more technical thing I just want to share before I demonstrate this is that the commentary system by default uses the audit database. But if you decide, wow, this is really amazing, we want to keep it separate for the audit database, you can go into the Central Management Council and pick a different type of database. So you can have a you can have just a database that only for the commentary system. So let me just show you how the commentary system works. Now, to add a brand new comment, you have to have uh, design rights. You have to be able to edit a webby document. But that's only to create the first one. So I can go in, and for those of you who are used to webby, you'll notice there's a new comment tab. I can say insert comment. And I, can say, I could write something like, this report is rather plain. Please add some color.
and I can save this. And then I can log in as a different person. So right now I'm the administrator. I'm going to log in as just myself. And even though I'm in reading mode, I can click on the comment and I can reply to it. I'd say something like um, greens and reds. And now that's the new comment. And I can save it. And then if I go back as the administrator, I can reopen the document. I can go in and respond again. And I even have the ability to go in. Now you notice again, I'm still in reading mode. Well, I can add more comments if I go back to design. I'm just writing a comment, are these numbers accurate? And if you want to draw attention to your comment, you do have the ability to format the style of it as well. So just to summarize the commentary system, you can leave comments in webby documents for others to read, and you can quickly go through the comment history in both design and, and read mode and, and comment on it. And you can also format your comments if there are any urgent responses. You can have things pop out more than others if necessary. Another feature I'm really happy to have in webby version 4.2 are geomaps. And they're available with the charts, and it uses the same engine as Lumira. So if you're familiar with working with the Lumira charting engine and working with its tweaks, it's just going to be very familiar to you. So but one thing to note, though, before you start using your geo maps, the developer will have to go in and assign any dimensions that should be part of a geo map. And then the mapping engine can use two types of data, just like in Lumira. You can use latitude, longitude data or you can use geographic name data. Let me close this down. And let me just go and quickly build a little report. So I can go in, I'll just bring in some state and city data. Bring in a couple of other measures like sales revenue quantity sold. <clears throat> I'll just get rid of my table because I just want to have a, just a chart to show you. Now before I start building my chart, my little geo map, I just have to remember to go over and right click on my state and I'll say edit as geography. And I'll say my state will be the region. And I'll just go in, and it's pretty good. Florida is giving me an issue because it's not sure if it's Florida, United States, or Florida of Uruguay, so I'll pick United States. And I'd also want to do the same thing with city. And then I can go and add a new chart. and I'll pick geographic. And I have three types of geographic charts. I have geotropleth, bubble chart, and pie chart. So I could try a tropleth chart, pick state, sales revenue, and voila, I have a nice chart I can look at. I can also go change the type. Maybe I want to do a Geo pie chart. I 
the city. And it just shows me which my, my cities are split up so I can see in Texas, Houston has the most, and then Austin and Dallas are pretty, are pretty close. So again, you can now create geomaps right inside of Web Intelligence without doing any tricks like you used to have to do uh, with mobile, or you don't have to buy a third party anymore. And you can also drill down in your geomaps if you want to see different levels of geography, just like you can do with the mirror. And also, I haven't demonstrated it, but you can also format your alert colors if you have something, if you have specific needs you need. Maybe you want to have a brighter red or you can, a blue for whatever reason, you can have different colors there. The last thing I'm very excited to share with web intelligence are the shared elements. So you can share, as I said, you can share part of your Webby document right in the VL Launchpad, and other people can use it in their Webby documents. All you have to do is grab your document, uh, click on it, click on the element inside the document, and from the linking tab, you'll share your element. So before I go into my slide, let me just demonstrate how this works. I'll go into my shared element one report. And maybe I really, I really like this pie chart. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click on it and I need to go to the linking tab and from here I can say shared element and I can either insert another one or here I do want to save it. I'll save it into my DSG demos folder. I'll call this uh, sales by state pi. So at least that way other people can kind of guess what I'm trying to accomplish with it. And I can even add a little description like this is a really cool pie chart. And I'll just close down my shared element of my current report. And if I press the refresh button, you'll see that my element is just sitting here with my other objects, my Excel file, my Webby documents. So now I can go in and open up another one, number two, and go to design. And I can go over and I have now this new piece for shared elements. I can go browse for one. And I can just drag it in. And voila, there's my pie chart. Now, one thing that it's, it is also bringing in, if I press the edit button, it does bring in its own query as well. So that's why it's able to work. So if your first query doesn't have all the objects, it'll make its own query. So that way it, it won't you know, drop anything, you won't lose anything. Now let's say I'm very happy with this, I'm going to save it. And if I go to currently used, I'll see it, it does list any shared objects that are in my current document. Let's say I go back to the first one. And I, was, I decided, you know what, this isn't as cool as, as I thought it was. I got a better idea. I'm going to go play with this. And I'm going to, actually, let me pick a different type here. And I'm gonna make it a donut chart. I'll even add some depth to it. That look kind of cool. Looks kind of like something out of like a scientific uh, magazine. Now, one thing to note is if I just save the document, it, it won't overwrite the, the piece. What I need to do is what I did before. I need to grab onto my new cool 3D donut, link it, share the element, and save it. And I want to go find, there's the name of my old one, sales by the one that's a really cool pie chart. I'm going to overwrite it. And then I'm going to go show you what happens in the 
shared element number two document, the one that had the old pie chart, the kind of the two-dimensional one. I'll go in here. And it still has the pie chart. So what I need to do is go over and it, you'll notice if you're a developer, you'll, this little, uh, little green circle shows you that there's been a change. So I have the ability to go in and grab my shared element and I can say update. And then when I press update, it will bring in the updated version. So now it's showing me the, the donut instead. And I can decide, you know what, I absolutely love this. I don't want this to ever change. So then I can click on it and I can unlink it. And so any changes to the original shared object will no longer trickle in. And you can see it's not shared anymore. It's now part of my second document right here. So again, just to repeat, so when you bring, if there's a new update to the element, the WebE document will display the refresh icon, and then the developer can ignore the notification, so they don't have to update it, or they can, also, they can choose to update it, or they can unlink it, so that way they won't get the little message that there's an update anymore. So just some benefits, again, of shared elements. You can save the WebE components separately from the original document, and you can use them in other documents. And also you have the ability to overwrite shared elements and then have the updates appear in multiple documents. That is what covers a lot of the new features of Webby. I just want to finish up talking about some of the new features in the Information Design Tool. While we're doing that, let me quickly get my little server up. So the new changes to the information design tool are regarding BEX universes and linked universes. So before, you, you would, if you'd have to make a universe, you'd have to go either straight to, down into BW or uh, oftentimes people would say, well, no, you don't want to use universes. You just want to use BEX right into Webby. But now you have the ability to go straight to a BEX query and build a universe over it. So it's, it's similar from what I've seen to like an, a building an OLAP universe, if you've ever done that, where it brings in the whole query, but then the universe developer can go and rename objects, or they can move them around, or delete objects not wanted to be shown in the universe. And you can also add additional universe security on top of the BEX query. You also have the ability to use different type of BW presentation layers, such as a short text or key. You can choose how your dimension will be displayed. So again, just the benefits of the BEX queries, just the ability to create universes directly right on them. And also you can just modify and add additional security, and then just choose the presentation layer of each object, just giving you more flexibility so you're not just seeing the original BEX query as it is. The last thing I want to mention are linked universes. So this was something that was available back in version XI, and I'm very, very happy to see it again in version 4.2. So you can go and create a new universe based on a link to an existing universe. One thing different, though, from version XI, in back in the version XI 3.1, you always had to use the same connection. And, but now in version 4.2, you can use a different connection, but they should contain the same objects. Why do you want to do that? Maybe you have different security rights and different connections. So it gives you a little bit more flexibility. But usually you, you, do want, you typically do want to have the same type of objects in both. And then changes from the existing universe will flow into the new linked universe. Let me just show this to you. It doesn't work quite the same as it did in version XI 3.1. So I just want to share just how it works a little differently from before. So uh, in, the old, in the old universe design tool, you'd just take your open universe and link it to something. But now in version 4.2, what you need to do is go and grab one of your published universes. So 
the one you're going to link to, it has to be published. And just bear with me one moment while I get into my system here. And so I'm going to go in, and I'm, I have a universe called Motors, and it has a lot of information. And it's, actually, I have it down here just to show what it looks like. But what I'm going to do, and rather than add new tables to Motors, I'm going to grab the published version, and I'm going to say Create Linked Universe. And I'm going to make a new universe called employees. And I am going to use the same connection. And you'll see in my employees universe, it's using the same connection. And I can just go in here. And I can add another table. And you can see the difference between the two. My, my linked tables are grayed out and I can't really do much to them. I can kind of move them around. But then here's the stuff that's added to this to this new employees universe is attached here. And I can also go to my business layer and bring in my new folder as well. So you can just see the difference between the original and the new. And the nice thing is if I were to go back to motors, republish it with some changes, those changes would automatically flow into my employees universe. So it's really great having the ability now to link universes in version 4.2. So that way you can have kind of you can have multiple people working on little small universes and have them come together. So again, the benefits of linked universes, you can create universes based on others. And as I said, the originals uh, updates the original universe will automatically appear in the linked universe. We've got about 14 minutes left if you want to do uh, for questions and answers. So again, my name is Brandon Novi uh, as a project lead at Dunn Solutions. And I'll hand it back over to you, Megan. Thank you, Brandon. Um, great presentation. We do have a lot of questions, and we'll go ahead and get started with those. Um, does the recycle bin work for personal folders? Uh, no, the recycle bin currently only works for the public folders. Next question is, does the cockpit require that you have a dashboard license? Uh, no, and I should be clear, uh, it does not require the dashboard license. Uh, it, it just comes with the tool. I, I use dashboards as more of an analogy, but just think of it as just, uh, just a nice, simple interface. Uh, nothing to do with dashboards or Lumera. It's just a nice, clean interface just to, to look into your server environment. OK, perfect. Um, how does the BI admin cockpit perform with more content, such as a large user base of 5,000 plus? Um, with, a, with a large user base, it does take a little bit longer to go, but it's, it's not horrible. And also, it does filter by by day, so it would just be looking at for it open up, just looking at today's stuff, today's information. Okay. Next we have, for the split installation, is that available for upgrading from 4.1 to 4.2 or only for upgrades following the 4.2 upgrade? Um, so the split installation, that's if you're, going, that's if you're installing 4.2. So, uh, so if you're going 4.1 to 4.2, it, it, sh it would work as long as you're doing the 4.2 uh, as the upgrade. Um, for parallel queries, does it still run the first query in sentence, in sequence rather, if the second query uses the results from query query one? Um, so that that one, I would have to get back on that answer. I don't, I don't have the off the top of my head. I don't have the answer for that one. Next 
question. Um, we have several webby docs which use query on a query. How will parallel queries work with those documents? Um, so if you're using the parallel query, I think that's similar to the last question. So I'd have to, okay. to, to get, do my research and get back to you on that answer. Next, does executing um, queries in a parallel require more resources on my server? Um, it may not, when, on the Webby server, it, you're just, it may not require more resources, but you are hitting the database. You are hitting more instances of the database, so you'd be hitting, you'd have to have three connections open on the database at once instead of you know, hitting it once and then the second. Yes, yep. Brandon, if I could jump in on that one. Um, basically, when you're doing queries in parallel, what you could do is think of it as more people executing queries at the same time. So it will require more resources on whatever, on the Webby services. Uh, it, it's the equivalent of having more people running queries at the same time, if you think about it that way. So if you know that lots of people are going to be running parallel queries, you may have to up the resources on your Webby services. Thank Perfect. you. Thank you. How does someone know a comment has been entered? Is there a message sent to their inbox? And as of right now, there doesn't seem to be any sort of uh, notification. If uh, if a comment, you just you just see it when you go and open the report. And do comments print? Um, I've not tested the printing of comments. They are cells, so I would I would have, I would have to get back to you to see if they actually do print. Okay. I, I do um, one thing you I did discover. Um, oh, I just want to share one little thing. If you, as of right now, if you are using Webby Mobile, you just want to. You may want to leave comments off of your mobile webbies because they seem to come out as uh, blank squares. But uh, again, SP3 is coming out in a f by the end of the month, and they may fix uh, change how that operates. Okay. Uh, next question is: Do comments export? Oh, is in if you like export to PDF? I can. Oh, I can just show you that. So if I go and I'll take one of my documents from my comments. So if I, let me just go to a PDF. So with PDF, they do come out as PDF. So I guess technically, yes, they, they would. If you're on a PDF, you can this way. And then just if you want to see how they look in Excel. By the way, Brandon, while you're doing that, the Excel example, um, seeing that they print in PDF means that when you print, they'll also show up. Oh, yes. As being um, exact, I know you can go directly to the printer. But yeah, I mean, they will print with PDF, yes. And they do also come in, as you can see, to Excel as well. They do come in as big merge cells. Perfect. Do you have uh, do you have to have a design permission to enter a comment? I see you can respond in read mode, but need to know if you can enter comment in read mode. Uh, no, you can only enter comments in design mode, and I can show that. Let me just open it up. Uh, it's completely different. So right now, I, I'm in read mode. So if I can't get to design, I don't have the ability to add a new comment. However, if there was a comment here, I can reply to them in reading mode. Otherwise, I have to be in design okay. to add a new one. Our next question is, moving from a clustered 4.1 environment to 4.2, what's involved? Um, let's see. What's involved? Um, 
if you need a little more time to yeah. answer that, we can certainly follow up. Yeah, that's more of a follow-up. I'd have to follow up just to see if there's uh, any, any, th any glitches or snags I've run into. Okay. Can the geography handle zip codes for the U.S.? Uh, and, and it will not work with zip codes. It only works with uh, latitude, longitude, as well as uh, geographic names. Okay. Can we map uh, map data at county level using GeoMaps? So that would still um, be geographic names and latitude and longitude, right? Uh, yeah. If I had. If you had county, you could use the, the subregion. So let me quickly just, I don't have any county data in front of me, but at least I can show you where you'd do that. So if I, let's say I made, I'll just bring in state. So you could, you'd use, I put state or for region and then subregions where I put the county information right here. Um, when will the HTML version of Web Intelligence be released? Oh, um, so the this is just the, the traditional DHTML version. This has uh, been available. Um, this is available right now. Um, there, there aren't any. There's, there's nothing been announced of like we're creating some sort of HTML5 version, but uh, I have they. SAP has been sh mentioning that in SP3 they will be adding more features that were only in released in Java into HTML. I'd have to get back to you to give you exactly what's coming in support pack 3 as um, into the HTML version, but they are working to bring more and more stuff into that. They're not going to make, as I said, just repeat myself, they're not going to make like an HTML5 version. They haven't announced anything like that at this point. Okay. Do you always have to accept the changes on a shared document? Um, no, you can just you can just ignore them. So if if you are very happy with what you have in your sh from the shared element, you can just ignore the the changes. Or you can even unlink it if you you can you can leave it there. You can unlink it if you never want it to change, or you can just ignore it and and let the versions get newer and newer, and you can just but then you can always have the ability to update it in the future if you leave it linked. Okay. Will the scheduled jobs cover publication jobs as well as the, in the admin cockpit? Um, I'd have to get back on that one if the, the publication jobs are falling there. Hold on one moment. We have some more coming in. Okay. Okay. Do we need to promote Core Universe manually along with Linked Universe? Let's see. Um, I've, I've not. Yeah, I have to get back on that one as well. I've not um, to see how, how they migrate together. If you go from uh, one server to another. Okay. What would the advantage of connection to SAP HANA versus SAP HANA Online? Uh, so the difference, uh, let me just share my slides again. So again, there's, there's just one, the HANA one allows you to go into the query panel. You can, go, you can pick specific analytic or calculation view and then you can feed what items you want into the query panel and, and maybe uh, depending on the speed of your HANA server maybe that's better but maybe if you have really quick fast response time for your HANA box then you can use the online version which constantly is hitting the HANA server again and again and again that's where you can use the second option. 
Because the, the okay. first one will hit it. It'll hit it once, and then it's grabbing all your data and putting it into Webby. And that might be fine. But then if you find you've got a lot of information and maybe it's too much to try to store it all in Webby, you can have it constantly go hit the database again and again. All right. Thank you very much. We actually have a lot more questions um, that we will follow up with everyone on, um, but we are coming up to the end of our time. We do very much appreciate everyone joining us. Um, and again, if we have not already covered your question, we will follow up with you for those. Um, we hope that everyone has a really great day. Thank you very much, Brandon, for your presentation, and we hope to see you on future webinars. Great. Thank you. Bye, everyone.